the great Central African rainforest, one of the world's richest environments, powered by the sun and the huge storms that regularly sweep over the trees. For millions of years, the loudest and most frightening sound here has been the tumult of these violent storms. For most, this is the sound of life, a celebration of the vitality of the forest. But for some, it is a death knell. After every storm, there will be some ancient giant tree blown down or struck by lightning. As well as watering the forest, the storms thin it out. These clearings are then maintained and enlarged by elephants. So between them, these two powerful shapers of the forest create a space where a new life flourishes. A space in the heart of Africa. A forest giant has been struck down. An area that has been in permanent shade for decades is suddenly exposed to the sun. Within weeks, vines are creeping up the stump. The rich ash at the base supports flourishing vegetation. And even on the blackened trunk, mosses and small ferns have gained a foothold. This is the classic rainforest story. The hole in the canopy lets in 10 times the usual amount of light and soft vegetation, creepers and young trees race towards the sun. But here in the African forests, that race is slowed down by elephants. Elephants are very fond of this new secondary growth and they regularly visit the clearings and eat all the young trees. In doing so, they slow down the healing process of the forest and keep the clearing open. Their dung enriches the soil, bringing grasses and herbs that attract other species. And their concentrated trampling and feeding damages more trees, which in time die and so the clearing grows. Forest elephants occur in fairly small numbers, but because of their size and mobility, their impact is large and widespread. Thanks to their behavior, the already rich forest is an even more varied place. One of the strangest creatures here is a forest giraffe, the okapi. First described from a piece of skin sent to London in 1900, the seldom seen okapi is the most dramatic large animal discovery of this century. It feeds entirely on leaves. So the secondary growth in tree fall gaps is important for its survival. Its long neck and tongue give the okapi a reach of some eight feet, less than half that of an elephant. But like the elephant, its grasp exceeds its reach. If it simply tore off leaves, the rapidly growing trees would soon lift them up and out of reach. By breaking the young trees down, the okapi ensures a steady supply of food for itself and others. These pencil-thin legs belong to the smallest antelope in Africa. 
the pygmy antelope. It too is very dependent on secondary growth, which is soft and nutritious, and more importantly, which this cat-sized creature can reach. Except to birds, monkeys and squirrels, most of the rainforest's productivity is out of reach, up there in the canopy. The soils are generally sandy and poor, but they are enriched by a constant rain of leaves, twigs and fruits. The nutrients in this mega mulch are recycled by countless fungi and microorganisms, the most visible of which are termites. They, in turn, are preyed upon mostly by unimaginable numbers of ants, but also by a very primitive and specialized predator, the white-bellied pangolin. Or, in this case, two pangolins, the mother curled protectively around her single baby. As the air cools, the night creatures begin to stir. This is a palm civet. There is no sunset in the forest. The green aquarium light gradually fades, as if on some giant dimmer switch, and the night shift prepares to take over. A red-chested owlet, just four inches high, comes awake. For the first few months of life, the baby pangolin rides on mum's tail. With that sensitive, ever-snuffling nose and powerful claws, she is well equipped to both find termite nests and then rip them open. Just before dark, the palm civet emerges, easily identified by the two white spots on its shoulder blades. It's a superb climber, completely at home among the network of lianas that lace the treetops. A forest weaver has nested in what should be a safe place, but the palm civet is a master aerialist. The soles of its feet are rubbery and can fold around thin vines and branches, giving it an almost monkey-like grip. But the nest is empty. The palm civet's main food is fruit, and whilst a successful animal, it occupies only a narrow niche in the forest. There is a much more successful family of small, spotted, cat-like animals here. A group that, like the palm civet, are in fact more closely related to mongooses. 
they are the genets. This is the common genet. There is also a giant genet and a much smaller species that is at home in the tops of the highest trees. These youngsters will grow up to be efficient hunters of mice, snakes and birds. The genets, in one form or another, are well distributed throughout the forest. One of them even evolved into a fisherman. The small streams that braid the forest floor are home to one of the rarest and shyest creatures on earth, the fishing genet. Known only from a handful of skins and skulls, until now, no naturalist had ever seen the fishing genet alive. The genet doesn't particularly like to get wet, so it has evolved some extraordinary behavior to avoid taking the plunge. Creeping to the water's edge, it gently pats the surface. Fly fishermen call this dapping. It then feels the surface with its long whiskers. If it detects vibrations made by a disturbed fish, it will go in for the catch. If it doesn't get good vibes, it moves on and stays dry. The female has already caught a catfish this night and dropped it close to her nest, a training exercise for her youngster. Unobserved in the 50 years since the animal was first described, the fishing genet has finally given up some of its secrets.
richness and variety of creatures on the forest floor is echoed in the canopy above. The pygmy galega, or bush baby, enjoys pollen and fruit. No bigger than a mouse, its main food is insects, whose minute scufflings it picks up with those radar dish ears. Some scufflings are not so minute. This is a goliath beetle. When Africa's smallest primate meets the continent's biggest beetle, insects are suddenly off the menu. Polite interest is all the bush baby can show in a beetle with twice its weight, but fortunately nothing like its speed. The red-chested owlet has caught a hawk moth. Bush baby, a praying mantis. The hawk moth is protected by a dense layer of fluffy scales that fly off in choking clouds. It doesn't deter the pocket sized owlet. Sprinkled with nature's own moon dust, the forest night is still young. A roosting grey-throated rail feels a vibration in its perch. A pangolin is on the termite trail. Protected by armor that makes up a fifth of their body weight, pangolins have few predators and appear to bumble through the forest like absent-minded artichokes. But to tree-nesting termites, they are deadly. Damaging the nest brings out armies of termites and the pangolin's tongue sweeps them up, mixed with lots of grit that helps grind them up in its stomach. A potter, a rabbit-sized primate, moves up to the canopy to search for resin that oozes from certain trees. Pangolins often hollow out a termite nest and spend the day sleeping curled up inside it. This one moves off, back the way it came. This time, the rail won't bother going back to bed. It's almost dawn. For all these creatures of the night, the sense of smell is paramount. For one species, odors seem to supply not just information, but deep and sensual pleasure. An African civet has found the spot where the fishing jennet was feeding. The faintest of scents, undetectable to humans, act like a switch, and he squirms in ecstasy, rubbing his throat glands on the magic spot. And for a civet, that was obviously a great way to start the day.
This pangolin has fed well. This one, perhaps disturbed by a predator in the night, has left his feeding late. He has broken the nest open, and the sound of the nest material pattering on the leaf litter attracts some plumed guinea fowl. Termite bonanza also brings in some black guinea fowl. These two species rarely associate, and like rival punk rockers round a bar, they flash their Mohicans and flush with excitement. There are several members of the pheasant family in the forest. One of them is Africa's rarest bird. In 1913, the great American ornithologist James Chapin saw an interesting feather in a pygmy's headdress. He bought it, and as he never matched it to any bird he collected in the Congo, he kept it. 23 years later, he saw, covered in dust on top of a cupboard in a corridor of a Belgian museum, a bird that jolted his memory. It was part of a large amateur collection from the Belgian Congo and had been put aside as it was thought to be just a domestic peahen. Chapin knew better. After nearly a quarter of a century, he still had his feather. He sent for it and it confirmed that this was indeed an unknown species. He immediately organized another expedition to the Belgian Congo and in 1937, he collected what is still the most exciting new bird to be described this century. Wow. The Congo peacock. Mm -hmm. The male is certainly not as magnificent as its Indian relative, but what the Congo peacock may lack in splendor, it makes up in mystery. It has only ever been seen by a handful of naturalists and was last observed over 30 years ago. The holy grail of bird watchers, the Congo peacock has now disappeared back into the heart of the rainforest. Elephants do not just slow down the regrowth of forest in the tree fall gaps. In some places, they actively enlarge those clearings. This is most likely to happen in places where they concentrate to drink or feed on mineral deposits. These animals come to suck up salts that occur some six feet below the surface. Pushing her trunk down as far as she can, the old cow blows bubbles to clear the gravel. She will need to do this several times to get down to the mineral bearing layer. The youngsters wait patiently. Either their trunks are too short or they've not learned the bubble trick. To get their minerals, they must ambush mum. Even something as simple as a mud bath helps to enlarge the clearing. Every elephant having a wallow will carry away many buckets of earth stuck to his hide. Hundreds of elephants over thousands of years. It all adds up.
grass and herbs that thrive in these sunlit spaces attract other forest dwellers, including the bongo, Africa's most beautiful and elusive antelope. And the forest buffalo, who must have grass to survive. These animals also like to drink at open sites too, where a leopard would have a hard time stalking them. As a trade-off for the security, they must sometimes put up with a little hassling. But when push comes to shove, the immature elephant backs down. Many birds benefit from the clearings too. These are Hartlaub's ducks, who need open, slow-moving water, rarely found in the forest. They also feed on the seeds and insects in the elephant's dung. African grey parrots come in large flocks to drink and to feed on grass bulbs and herbs, which they share with the Sitatunga a smaller relative of the bongo. There are a number of trees whose seeds will only germinate if they are passed through an elephant's gut. So, as well as providing a heavy-duty pruning and clearing service, elephants are very involved with the replanting process too. Spiritually, these giant gardeners give the forest a very special attention. Physically, they create a mosaic of ever-changing habitats that support a kaleidoscope of species. Some of them strange beyond imagination. One of the strangest creatures in the forest is the spaniel-sized water chevrotain, which spends the day hiding in holes or hollow logs. This is a female. In the males, the canine teeth grow into sharp little tusks. They can cause serious injury. And this one has been fighting. A primitive species that is related to both antelopes and pigs, the water chevrotain has been around for over 20 million years. It feeds on fungi, fallen fruit and flowers, and is always found fairly close to water. Stream beds and swampy areas provide a good food supply, but more importantly, they provide the chevrotain with a refuge in times of danger. When it feels threatened, it has a remarkable response. 
It heads for the nearest deep water, slips in, and hides below the surface. The chevrotain must compete for food with a large group of small antelopes, the dikers. This one, the white-bellied, specializes in following monkeys for the fruit that they knock down. The tiny blue diker can manage unbelievably large fruits. And the powerful jaws of the bay diker break all but the very hardest of seeds. By juggling their slightly different talents and requirements, five or six species of diker are able to coexist among the rich pickings on the forest floor. The one thing they all have in common are these restless tails. It's a way of signaling to each other, but it's also a sure way to attract the attention of their two main predators. With a wingspan of seven feet, the crowned eagle is the largest in Africa. In the forest, it feeds almost entirely on monkeys and dikers. The leopard kills anything from mice to a carpi and buffalo. For it too, dikers are a favorite. With predators like these, it's hard to imagine anyone wanting to attract attention. But one animal is unworried. This tail, like the frill on the end of a lamb chop, could signal a good meal. But it comes complete with lethal toothpicks. The brush-tailed porcupine scours the forest floor for fruits and nuts. And over several days, he has eaten most of the seeds from this giant sea bean pod. Though only rabbit-sized, he goes about his business with no concern for enemies. Any attacker is likely to target this tantalizing tail and end up with a faceful of quills. The porcupine can attend to his meal, safe in the knowledge that any predator will quickly get the point. The civet Sniffing every inch of the way, closes in on an interesting smell. This football-sized fruit has started to ferment, and the faint aroma switches him straight into squirming mode. In some countries, the civet is kept captive, and a secretion from its anal gland is important in making cosmetic perfumes. What still eludes perfume producers is the secret of what triggers these convulsions of pure pleasure. That fragrance, mercifully, is not yet on the market. Calvin Klein, eat your heart out. The antics of the civet cause a twitching in the litter. It's getting up time for the giant elephant shrew. These six inch high insectivores spend the day searching the forest floor with that highly mobile nose. One or two young are born, 
and after about three weeks they leave the nest, which is little more than a low mound of leaves. They never seem to quite grow into those coltish hind legs. But they do get better at finding a teat. To make her nest, the female first efficiently clears the site. Uh, efficiently clears the site. Then she scoops out a hollow, which she lines with chewed and trampled leaves to give a firm floor. Finally, it is roofed over with a heap of dry leaves. It takes a couple of hours to make, and every few days she moves and starts again. It's been a long day. If the giant elephant shrew is a remarkable piece of evolution, the giant otter shrew is even more so. It is well named. The head with its long whiskers and pinhead eyes is classic shrew. The body with its flattened muscular tail is all otter. And as for giant, it is at least a hundred times heavier than the average forest shrew. Like the fishing genet, the otter shrew has evolved to exploit that rather plentiful rainforest environment, the water. Some two feet long, its body tapers almost imperceptibly into its powerful tail. Its small, soft hands are strangely unadapted for swimming and, apart from some rather inefficient steering, are not used. The otter shrew hunts crabs in the shallows, but it also has a great turn of speed and can easily catch fish. Killing it with a swift bite, it eats out the crab in seconds. It will eat 20 or more in a night.
Following its nose, as always, the civet makes an exciting discovery. He will not hurt the pangolin, but when it's nervous, the anteater activates a gland that produces a revolting odor. What more could a civet want? To him, the stench is as irresistible as catnip. He goes straight into olfactory overload and treats the pangolin as he would treat any of the other great smells he finds on the forest floor, with squirms of delight. Despite its strange shape and the weight of its armor, the pangolin swims quite well. But there is an even stranger swimmer here. And it takes a threat from a predator to put it through its paces. Round eagle has the chevrotain in its sights. If he sees it, the eagle will not hesitate to plunge into the water, and it could easily overpower the 30-pound antelope. But the chevrotain is completely at home here. It doesn't just swim. It actually walks on the bottom, just like a hippo. It keeps its eyes open, but obviously sees rather poorly, probably much like human vision underwater. Keeping its belly close to the ground to avoid being lifted by the flow, it simply walks away from danger, four feet below the surface. If necessary, it can save oxygen by simply resting on the bottom. After about four minutes, it must go up for air.
It has taken millions of years of evolutionary move and counter move to produce these complex relationships that are the everyday stuff of life in the forest. The rainforest is not just a collection of extraordinary individual creatures. It is an intricate system that is so much more than the sum of its parts. It's a wise rule that if you're going to tinker with a machine you do not understand, make sure you keep all the pieces. We have only just begun to understand the rainforest, but all over the world we are dismantling it and we are losing pieces. These African rainforests are some of the richest habitats on Earth. That diversity is partly due to elephants and to the way their habits make food and space available to a host of smaller creatures. But elephants all over Africa are threatened. Now, as well as thunder, there is another loud noise in the forest. Gunfire. This new sound threatens to bring a different kind of storm. A storm of disastrous consequences. A storm in which not just leaves and a few old trees will fall, but one which could bring down the whole system. When an elephant dies in the forest, there are no scavengers to eat that mountain of flesh. It simply rots away. Toxic fluids leaking from the carcass kill the surrounding trees. Even in death, the elephant creates one last clearing. The importance of the elephant's role in the forest is still not fully understood. And before we have the answers, these giants may be gone. What we do know for sure is that if the elephant disappears, many other species will follow into that darkness leaving the forest and the planet a poorer place.